I spent a year and a half in uh, I'm working in Boston. Like, yeah, well, no, you've been there. I think a lot more, yeah, because I have pressures from the clients. Believe me, I'm getting it. Yeah. It seems accurate. Yeah, so I think, which I actually think, I think it's really close everybody. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. 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 Welcome to today's meeting on the a very interesting topic, Syria and Iran. Is it a strategic alliance or a marriage of uh, convenience? Um, Mr. Gudarzi is the author of a wonderful book. And for those of you who come regularly to our meeting, you have heard me introducing books, but I hardly use adjectives to say this is wonderful or extraordinary and so on. But this is really a superb book, and it reads like a thriller. Um, the book is called Syria and Iran, Diplomatic Alliance and Power Politics in the Middle East. Uh, Jubin Gudarzi is a professor of international relations at Webster University in Geneva, uh, Switzerland. Uh, he has worked as a researcher and analyst with numerous institutes in the U.S. and Europe, including the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C., and the Ford Foundation in New York. Uh, he has worked extensively with the U.N. High Commissioner for Refugees in Geneva and working with refugees issues in the Middle East, particularly Iraq, as well as in the Balkans and the African Great Lakes. He holds a doctorate in international relations from LSE, where he researched the effects of Syrian-Iranian cooperation on the regional balance of power, especially the politics of Iraq, Israel, and the U.S. And of course, um, he's dealing, he dealt with two countries where access to archives is almost impossible. And uh, I'm sure in Iran he had easier access to people than in Syria. So we are all here to okay. hear you. Thank and, you very uh, much. Welcome to the center and hope to see you back again. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you very much for your kind words, Dr. Esfandiari. It's a, a, a pleasure and privilege to be here today. Um, I um, feel very much at home here. I'm visiting from Geneva doing research for my next project, um, U.S. policy in the Persian Gulf region, more of a diplomatic history. Um, and um, so I'm very grateful for this chance to speak here at the Wilson Center. I also, for um, feel very much at home in Washington in the sense that I uh, lived here for um, 11 years from 82 to 93. I did my BA here at American University in the School of International Service, uh, then did an internship for a year, and then I did my MA in Arab Studies at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service, and then I worked here, and then I left in 93, went to the other side of Atlantic to England initially, and then uh, S Switzerland since 99. Um, as, as author of a book on the subject of Syria and Iran, I think I believe that the alliance between Syria and Iran is a very vast and uh, fascinating subject. One cannot do it justice in 35, 40 minutes, but I shall try to highlight some of the important features and facts about the structure and evolution of the relationship. Uh, to begin with, one might ask why study the Syrian-Iran alliance? What purpose would it serve? Uh, what lessons could be termed could be learned in terms of understanding Middle Eastern affairs. I think there are three important reasons, generally speaking. Uh, first, the alliance has had a significant impact on Middle East politics over the past three decades, 
as we have seen again um, over the past few years since the 2003 Iraq War, the 34-day-long Lebanon crisis in the summer of 2006, and also other recent events. Uh, secondly, it has proven to be an enduring relationship um, that has lasted 29 years now, which is quite extraordinary when one takes into consideration the volatility and the shifting political sands in the Middle East. Uh, thirdly, I believe that the alliance is still misunderstood in key respects by many regional and political observers. Over the past quarter century, the two partners have had some noticeable successes in frustrating the designs and policies of Iraq, Israel, and the U.S. in the Middle East. Through their continuous collaboration, uh, they played a critical role in stemming um, Iraq's invasion of Iran in 1980 and ensuring that Saddam Hussein's Iraq would not become the predominant power in the Middle East. They were also able to thwart Tel Aviv's strategy to bring Lebanon into its own orbit following the 1982 Israeli invasion of that country and occupation of almost half its territory. Through the use of Lebanese proxies, most notably Hezbollah, Syria and Iran were able to expose the limits of Israeli military power and force Tel Aviv to withdraw from uh, the territory that it occupied between 1984 and 2000. Concurrently, in the same arena, they were able to inflict one of the very few foreign policy setbacks that Ronald Reagan suffered during his two terms in office as U.S. President in the 1980s. Even in the post-Cold War era, um, with U.S. predominance on the regional and world stage, uh, the imposition of sanctions on both countries and the 2003 U.S.-led invasion of uh, Iraq, Syria and Iran have been able to wield considerable power and influence in the Middle East, especially in Iraq, Lebanon, and directly and indirectly on world oil markets, as um, recent events have demonstrated. Uh, contrary to prevailing views, the alliance has been primarily, although not completely, defensive in nature, uh, aimed at neutralizing Iraqi and Israeli offensive capabilities in the region and preventing U.S. encroachment in the Middle East. Um, the, the major exception, I would argue, would be the, um, Iran's efforts to invade and topple Saddam Hussein uh, during the six-year period between 1982 and 1988. While the initial impetus for the alliance came from the overthrow of Iran's conservative pro-Western monarchy in February 1979, um, the Iraqi invasion of Iran in September 1980 served as, the major, as a major catalyst in bringing Syria and Iran closer together. with Syria providing invaluable diplomatic and military assistance to help Iran stave off defeat and expel Iraqi forces from its territory by May 1982. In turn, when Israel launched its second invasion of Lebanon and challenged Syria in its backyard a month later in June 1982, Iran lent its support uh, to Syria in part by mobilizing Lebanon's Shias to drive out Israeli and Western forces during 1983 to 1985. More recently, um, the Bush administration's war on terror, and especially the US-led invasion of Iraq in 2003, have raised concerns in Damascus and Tehran, high, um, ushering in a period of heightened cooperation and frequent consultations between the two allies. Um, in, in general, Defensive alliances which have limited and set objectives are more stable and durable. This in part explains the longevity of the 29-year-long relationship. Offensive alliances quite often fall apart once the opponent has been attacked and vanquished as the alliance members then squabble over the fruits of their victory. Furthermore, um, for Iran, the Persian Gulf region is the main area of concern while for Syria, it is the Arab-Israeli theater. Over time, particularly after a number of crises in the relationship, which erupted between 1985 and 1988, when Iran in particular was pursuing certain policies in Lebanon ex against the wishes of Syria, through continuous consultations, an understanding was eventually reached on key issues, whereby Syrian interests took precedence in the Arab-Israeli arena, while in the Gulf region, Damascus would defer to Tehran. In terms of the longevity of the alliance, the mere fact that the alliance has endured for so many years gives it considerable weight and importance. 
It has, of course, gone through phases when the two partners have engaged in intensive cooperation and have been quite active, and also through long periods when the level of activity has decreased considerably. But this is not meant to the demise of the partnership. One such phase was the period between 1991 and 2003 when cooperation was limited primarily to joint efforts to develop and improve their ballistic missile technological capabilities and to support Hezbollah, especially to challenge the Israeli military presence in the self-declared security zone in southern Lebanon until the 2000 withdrawal. Therefore, it could be argued that the alliance went through a quote-unquote dormant phase following the 1991 Kuwait conflict and the end of the Cold War, with the partnership being reinvigorated by and with the 2003 U.S.-led invasion of Iraq. A clear sign of this, uh, for example, was when Syrian Prime Minister Mohammad Najd al Utri, on a visit to Iran in February of 2005, uh, declared that the two partners were presenting a quote-unquote united front against the challenges they faced in the Middle East. I think another important point that needs to be made, which also sheds light on the nature and longevity of the partnership, is the role of ideology. Ironically, a crucial factor in the relative success and longevity of the alliance is that the political elites of these two authoritarian regimes espouse different ideologies, and herein lies the paradox. Quite often as the historical record during the latter part of the 20th century in the communist bloc and the Middle East demonstrated, alliances between states that adhere to the same transnational ideology are more likely to be short-lived than those in which ideology plays a secondary role. This is particularly true in the Middle East, where authoritarian regimes predominate um, and frequently use ideology as a tool to boost their political legitimacy and power base domestically and in neighboring countries. Revisionist ideologies such as pan-Arabism and Islamic fundamentalism have been quite frequently divisive because they are used to project power and influence and to destabilize rival states. In the Middle East, the record clearly shows that states sharing a common ideology compete for the mantle of leadership rather than form durable alliances. This was quite evident in the rivalries between the pan-Arab regimes in Egypt, uh, Syria, and Iraq during the 1950s and 60s, all the way up until the 1990s. If we look at the competition between the rival wings of the Ba'ath Party in Syria and Iraq, uh, another point in example in another point in example in this respect was the animosity between the Islamic Republic of Iran and the Taliban led Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan until 2001. It should not be forgotten that Tehran almost went to war with the Taliban in August 1998 after the massacre of thousands of Afghan ref, Afghan civilians and a dozen Iranian co consular officials um, in the northern um, city of Mazar Sharif, the last anti-Taliban stronghold, uh, when more people were killed than in the September 11 attacks. Iran massed, at the time, Iran massed over 100,000 troops along the Afghan-Iranian border and held air and, um, and land maneuvers. When looking at Syria and Iran, um, it is evident that Iran, a non-Arab country, is not trying to be the standard bearer of Arab nationalism, unlike Syria, which considers itself to be the quote-unquote, the beating heart of Arabism. Syria, for its part, is not vying for the leadership of the Islamic revivalist movement in the Middle East. It should be underlined that there has been neither ostensible competition on the ideological level, except in Lebanon, uh, between 1985 and 1988, nor fear that one partner might, might upstage the other precisely because of distinctly different ideological platforms. At the same time, though, it should be noted that Ba'athist Syria and Islamist Iran have been fiercely independent states whose political elites share certain perceptions and worldviews, and in fact, their secular and fundamentalist ideologies overlap in certain respects. While Iran has used its brand of revolutionary Islam to transcend nationalism, create Muslim unity in the region by surmounting Arab-Iranian political divisions and Shia-Sunni religious differences, and demonstrate its solidarity by actively participating in the Arab-Israeli struggle, Syria, as the self-proclaimed 
um, birthplace and heartland of Arabism, has striven to overcome the political fragmentation of the Arab world by acting as a vehicle for Arab unity. Um, so Hafez Assad, Rola Khomeini, and their successors have viewed the Middle East um, as a strategic whole. I think that's important to bear in mind. And regarded their alliance as a vital, vital tool to assert themselves and further and to further what they see as in the Arab and Islamic interest and to increase their room for maneuver by diminishing foreign, particularly U.S. influence in the region. As a result, um, to advance their common agenda over the, over the years and decades, uh, both regimes have put longer-term interests before short-term gains. This um, was clearly manifested, I think, in the period between 1985 and 1988, when the temptation to terminate the alliance may have been great, particularly for Syria. But instead, the alliance was consolidated due to overarching strategic concerns and long-term interests. Um, excuse me. Uh, if you look at this first chart, I think this chart will help clarify the foreign policy priorities of the Syrian and Iranian regimes and the role and impact of their ideologies and worldviews. It's a simple chart, but um, I think it's helpful nonetheless. As you can see, the core priority for the Syrian Ba'athist and Iranian Islamist governments in view of their authoritarian nature is, of course, regime survival. Uh, second comes national security meaning the maintenance of the territorial integrity and in independence of the respective countries. In terms of national security, elaborating a little bit, for Syria, its two main policy objectives are, one, to regain the Golan Heights occupied by Israel since 1967, and two, if it cannot dominate, at minimum, to have veto power over Lebanese affairs to ensure the government in Beirut does not adopt policies detrimental to Damascus interests. With respect to Iran, staying on national security still, its two main policy aims are, one, to be the primary regional player in Persian Gulf affairs, and two, to ensure a government hostile to Tehran does not eventually emerge in Baghdad, partially due to historical reasons, stretching back centuries, but partially also in view of the eight-year war with Iraq, which was the bloodiest war in Iran's 2003 million, three millennia of history. Third, as I just explained, is the aim to protect and promote, in the case of Damascus, what it sees as Arab interests, and in the case of Tehran, what it perceives as Islamic interests in the region. I will turn to my next point about the alliance being misunderstood. Um, I've already talked a little bit about the defensive nature in principle, but I will give three further examples. Since the inception of the alliance, one has consistently seen many scholars and observers writing off the Tehran-Damascus partnership as a short-term opportunistic alliance or marriage of convenience against Saddam Hussein's Iraq that would rapidly dissolve once the Iraqi dictator was overthrown. Well, Saddam Hussein was toppled five years ago, yet the alliance still stands today. Uh, in, in the book, I look at this matter closely and conclude that this line of thinking is too simplistic, uh, requiring instead a more nuanced and sophisticated approach and understanding of the overall relationship. I think another misconception or myth has been to attribute the cooperation between the two regimes to the fact that the Syrian leadership is Alawite and um, Iran's clerical regime is Shia. I do not think that this argument stands up under close scrutiny. The Syrian regime is secular, and its relationship with Tehran has been based on common political, strategic, and economic concerns. Furthermore, just as many Sunni or Orthodox Sunni Muslims may not consider Shias to be true Muslims, there are those in Shia Islam who, who do not consider Alawites to be true Muslims. One hears, for example, many arguments, for example, that Hafez Assad did not visit um, Iran while Ayatollah Khomeini was alive because the latter did not consider the Syrian leader to be a true Muslim. From my perspective, the religious element has not been a determining factor and it has had little, if any, salience. The, the last misconception or myth I would like to touch on is the belief that Iran, in essence, bought Syrian fealty during the 1980s with free oil shipments. In the book, I have dealt with this issue extensively. Um, that's putting it mildly, maybe. 
Uh, but again, I conclude that this argument is false. Um, if economic and financial imperatives had been the key determinants of Syrian foreign policy formulation, the partnership would have collapsed, but this was not the case. Even today, one comes across articles stating that the relationship is only a tactical arrangement, and if the West extends economic incentives to Syria, Damascus will reorient its foreign policy. I doubt this very much, unless perhaps this is um, part of an overall package, which includes the restoration of the Golan Heights to Syrian sovereignty and specific security concerns. Um, in terms of the different phases in the evolution of the alliance, um, if you can look at this, I think overall six phases can be identified in the evolution. As you can see, uh, phase one, the emergence of the alliance between 79 and 82, uh, phase two, the, emer the, the, the zenith and limits of Syrian of Syri Iranian power from 82 to 85. Three, intra-alliance tensions and consolidation, 85 to 88. Four, the containment of Saddam's Iraq in the Levant and Gulf, 88 to 91. Alliance cooperation in the post-Cold War era for that 12-year period between 91 and 2003. And six, the reinvigoration of the alliance since the 2003 Iraq War. The first three phases were key, I think, and constituted the formative years of the alliance, leading to the consolidation of the relationship. Um, if one understands the period between 1979 and 1988, particularly the period between 85 and 88, phase three, one can easily comprehend and decipher how the partnership has evolved in spite of the radical changes and transformations that have occurred on the regional and international level. I will give a brief overview of the six periods. During phase one, it is noteworthy that Syria was the first country, first Arab country, to recognize the provisional government of Prime Minister Mehdi Bazargan after the overthrow of the Shah, and overall the third after the Soviet Union and Pakistan. As I mentioned, Damascus provided invaluable diplomatic and military support to Tehran following the, the Iraqi invasion of Iran in order to turn the tide of the war, most notably by thwarting the emergence of a united Arab front against Iran um, at the Amman summit in November 1980, uh, hosted by Saddam Hussein's staunchest ally at the time, King Hussein of Jordan. Syria massed 30,000 troops along its border with Jordan and persuaded half a dozen Arab League members to boycott the summit. It also served as an important conduit for arms shipments to Iran and provided various forms of military assistance, uh, including, which I mentioned in the book, facilitating the Iranian airstrike against the Iraqi military airfields at H3, Al-Walid, in the Iraqi panhandle 50 miles um, east of the Jordanian-Iraqi border in April 1981, which resulted in the destruction of about 15 to 20 percent of Iraq's air force. The alliance itself was formalized in March of 1982 when a high-level Syrian delegation uh, headed by then Foreign Minister Abdel Halim Khaddam visited Tehran and concluded a series of bilateral agreements on oil, trade, and a secret one on military matters. Syria also sub subsequently shut off the flow of Iraqi oil through the IPC trans-Syrian pipeline to the Mediterranean, thereby reducing Iraq's oil exports by more than half a million barrels a day, which translated into losses um, of $17 million a day for Iraq, or $6 billion per annum. Phase two was marked by close cooperation and intensive efforts to respond to new challenges, this time in the Levant, after the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in the summer of 1982 and the rout of the Syrian forces there. Hafez Assad devised a two-track strategy to minimize the risk of further escalation and direct military confrontation with Israel, and at the same time roll back the Israelis. In the book, I call this the sword and shield strategy. The political linchpin of the strategy was serious special relationships with the Soviet Union on the international level, with Iran on the regional level, and with uh, Lebanese allies on the local uh, level. The sword, the defensive component, the sword, was to utilize Iran's aid and influence among Lebanon's Shias and others to wage a campaign of subversion, terror, and guerrilla warfare against their mutual opponents, the Jemael government, the Israelis, 
um, and the U.S. and French contingents of the multinational force in Lebanon. The defensive element, the shield, if you like, was to rebuild and expand Syria's conventional forces with Soviet assistance in order to deter an Israeli first strike and achieve strategic parity with Israel. The strategy worked well and paid off handsomely as their opponents were dealt a series of devastating blows resulting in the Israeli retreat and the withdrawal of U.S. and French troops by 1984-85. Uh, just to name a few, um, we had the assassination of Bashir Jamal in September 82, the demolition of the IDF, the Israeli Defense he Headquarters, Forces Headquarters, in Tyre in November 82, the destruction of the U.S. Embassy in Beirut in April 83, the bombing of the U.S. Uh, the, the bombing of the barracks of the U.S. Marine and French paratrooper contingents of the multinational force in October of '83, the repeated demolition of the IDF Israel Defense Forces headquarters in Tyre in uh, November '83, and the bombing of the U.S. Embassy annex in East Beirut in September '84. This all led to the withdrawal of U.S. forces by early '84 and the, the scrapping of the Israeli-Lebanese peace treaty of May 83, and the phased withdrawal of Israeli troops from most of the territory that they had initially overrun. At the same time, though, uh, Iran's refusal to terminate hostilities with Iraq and invade uh, Iraqi soil and the continuation of the Gulf War led to counter moves, resulting in the gradual emergence of the Iraqi-Jordanian-Egyptian axis backed by Washington and Riyadh, and the relative decline of Syrian Iranian power in the region. During phase three, which constituted the most problematic phase in the evolution of the partnership, uh, Syria's failure to end the Lebanese civil war after the, the collapse of the tripartite agreement of 1985, and Iran's continuation of the Gulf War further undermined the position of the Tehran-Damascus nexus. And at the same time, the two allies developed conflicting uh, agendas in Lebanon as the Israeli threat receded. On almost every issue in Lebanon, the two allies stood on opposite sides. For example, with the emergence of the Amal Hezbollah rivalry, Syria backed the former while Iran supported the latter. The two had differing visions of the political future of Lebanon, one desiring a secular state within its sphere of influence, while the other favored the creation of a theocratic system. The Syrians also backed the Amal-led siege of the Palestinian refugee camps. Um, in Beirut between, in, in Lebanon uh, between 1985 and 1987, much to Iran's dismay, which tried to mediate and end the confrontation peacefully. There were also other areas of contention, such as the Syrian-Jordanian rapprochement at the time, intermittent Syrian-Iraqi negotiations, and Syria's confrontation with the Islamic, un this, with Serious confrontation with the Sunni Islamic Unification Movement, um, the Tawhid Movement of Sheikh Said Shaban in the northern Lebanese city of Tripoli. However, through constant consultations, the two allies were able to prioritize their interests and redefine the parameters of their cooperation during 1985 to 88, thereby leading to the maturation and the consolidation of the alliance. The resurgence of Iraq's power by the late 1980s as it had turned the tables as it turned the tables on Iran in the Gulf War, the gradual withdrawal of Soviet support for Syria during the Gorbachev years, the concurrent ascendance of US influence in the Middle East, and the need for the two allies to cooperate in order to stabilize the situation in Lebanon all together helped cement the relationship. With regard to phase four, um, the, two cooperated, um, the two cooperated during this period in order to check Iraqi power and also to quell uh, Michel Aoun's anti-Syrian uh, revolt during 1988-89 in Lebanon, which was interestingly enough backed by Israel, Iraq, and, and other states. Uh, the cooperation was also made imperative by the formalization of the counteraxis that had emerged in the 1980s with the creation of the short-lived, as some of you may recall, uh, the short-lived Arab Cooperation Council, the ACC, consisting of Iraq, uh, Jordan, Egypt, and North Yemen in February of 1999. It is interesting to note that the level of concern was such that immediately after the establishment of the ACC, Saudi Arabia rushed to sign a non-aggression pact with Iraq in March of 1989. 
Saddam Hussein began to assert himself during this period by providing at least one-third of the arms supply to Michel Aoun's forces in Lebanon, assisting Mauritania in its conflict with Senegal, aiding the Khartoum government in its efforts to crush the rebellion in southern Sudan, encouraging the unification of North and South Yemen, maintaining an inflexible stance um, in the peace negotiations with Iran, uh, holding joint military exercises with Amman in Jordan, and making infl inflammatory statements threatening Israel. During the 1991 Kuwait conflict, Iran, which had been exhausted after eight years of war with Iraq, um, stayed out of the fray and remained neutral, while Syria joined the U.S.-led coalition in order to cut down Saddam Hussein and reap the benefits of being on the side of the victors, including George H.W. Bush's promise to resolve the Arab-Israeli conflict. As stated earlier in the post-1991 period, phase five, following the Kuwait conflict and the end of the Cold War, the two continued to cultivate close political, military, and economic links in view of the dominant position of the U.S. in the region and the collapse of the Soviet Union um, and the rapidly changing political landscape uh, in the Middle East and the uncertainties that it brought. Both supported Hezbollah in order to steer and control events in Lebanon and to make sure that Israel paid a price for the continued occupation of the self-declared security zone and also the Golan Heights through an increasingly effective guerrilla campaign mounted by the Lebanese movement throughout the 1990s, which culminated in the Israeli withdrawal in May 2000. At the same time, Syria and Iran uh, cooperated to develop ballistic missiles. Um, in addition, Tehran, along with Pyongyang, helped build missile production facilities in Syria, for example, in Hama and Aleppo. Between 1991 and 2000, though, Damascus participated in U.S.-brokered peace talks with Tel Aviv in a bid to regain the Golan Heights in exchange for peace and recognition of Israel. However, this process did not result in a breakthrough. Washington, at the same time, tried to corner and isolate Iran during much of the 1990s under the dual containment policy. Although expectations emerged for thaw in U.S.-Iran in relations during the Khatami era, the, the eight-year presidency of Mohammad Khatami in Iran, this proved to be a false dawn as the reformist president demonstrated his lack of resolve and courage to take on the more hardline elements within the regime who opposed any rapprochement with the U.S. Perhaps the most detrimental aspect of Syrian-Iran policy during the 1990s was the support both states provided to varying degrees for Islamist movements such as Hamas and Islamic Jihad. Although, in my opinion, uh, emphasis on that, one could be skeptical whether at the end of the day, I think, the Oslo process would have borne fruit. I think the suicide attacks undertaken by extremists, especially those targeting civilians in Israel, did much to, uh, to destroy um, trust and confidence uh, and any prospects of success in the peace negotiation. So, uh, so extremists, I think, made, did a disservice. And at the same time, uh, you had extremists on the other side, of course. Um, the most poignant example being, of course, the, um, the assassination of Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin by an Israeli extremist in November 1995. Finally, in phase six, since the U.S.-led invasion and occupation of Iraq, cooperation between the two sides has, mar has increased markedly. I'll go perhaps more into this during the q and I'm just going to make a few points. I'm, I'm, I can't cover everything. Um, Syria and Iran, I think, viewed the overthrow of Saddam Hussein by U.S.-led forces in April 83, to, I'm, I'm sorry, 2003, with ambivalence. On one hand, both welcomed the toppling of their longtime foe. On the other hand, the speed of the military victory initially raised fears that they could be the next targets in the Bush administration's war on terror. However, once it became clear that the Bush administration was facing major difficulties and becoming bogged down in Iraq, um, there was a degree of relief in Damascus and Tehran, or as some say on the other side of the Atlantic, Schadefreude. Uh, the two allies are still concerned about the prominent U.S. military presence in Iraq and the region, and over the f but over the past five years, uh, they believe that U.S. power and influence has begun to wane. Iran has tried to maintain and cultivate uh, close ties with all the major Iraqi political parties and militias, particularly the Shia ones, in order to ensure Baghdad, Baghdad would not, will not assume a hostile stance towards it. 
while it is not completely clear whether Damascus is still aiding and abetting the, the passage of Arab and Sunni Muslim fighters from Syria into Iraq, as it did in the run-up and during the 2003 war, I think it is at the very least looking at some of these movements with benign neglect. I can elaborate that more in the, during the Q&A if you'd like. Um, neither Damascus nor Tehran want, um, want Iraq to be plunged into anarchy and civil war. But as long as, from their perspective, as long as Washington maintains a hostile stance towards them, they would prefer uh, the continuation of a degree of resistance to pin down U.S.-led forces and deflect attention away from them. Um, basically, managed or controlled chaos, as some observers <coughs> have put it. With regard to the 2006 crisis in Lebanon, um, irrespective of whether the war had been planned by either or both sides, I think one thing is for certain. Once the hostility started, the, the Bush administration found it beneficial to prevent a speedy end to the conflict in the UN Security Council for, a, for more than a month, calculating that a sustained Israeli land, sea, and air assault on Lebanon lasting several weeks would weaken and hopefully destroy Hezbollah, thereby denying the Syrian-Iranian camp of one of its major trump cards in the regional power struggle against Washington and Tel Aviv. From the Bush administration's perspective, the dis destruction of Hezbollah would have also paved the way um, for possible military action against Iran if the dispute over Iran's nuclear program was not resolved politically on terms that Washington found advantageous and favorable. This is because potential Hezbollah retaliation against Israel serves as a tripwire for U.S. military action against Iran and Syria. Um, it is noteworthy, um, I think, that in a somewhat premature but telling statement during the conflict, uh, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice asserted we are witnessing the birth pangs of a new Middle East. Who won the showdown in, um, in the summer of 2006? Well, although Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah claimed victory, in the greater scheme of things, uh, I think it was not so much Hezbollah that won, but Israel that lost. Israel set high benchmarks for victory, including the freedom of the two Israeli soldiers and the annihilation of Hezbollah. However, it fell short of its stated objectives. Hezbollah was weakened, but at the same time, it demonstrated enormous resourcefulness and resilience during the fighting, particularly in the realm of electronic warfare, EW, and in the immediate aftermath of the conflict uh, with its recovery, rehabilitation, and reconstruction efforts. It should be underscored uh, though that subsequent to the month-long um, war, Hezbollah gained enormous popularity and support among the masses in the Arab Muslim world. Looking at more recent events, um, it seems highly improbable there will be a significant shift in U.S. policy towards Syria and Iran, at least until the new, new U.S. administration assumes, assumes office next January. Although the prospect of, um, the prospects of a military strike on Iran have decreased markedly after the publication of the U.S. National Intelligence Estimate on Iran's nuclear activities last December, which had concluded that Tehran had halted its nuclear weapons program in 2003, tensions still remain high. One cannot completely dismiss the prospect of at least aerial strikes on Iran. At the same time, the, the likelihood of major advances on the Palestinian-Israeli track of the peace process seem remote. It also remains to be seen whether Turkey's quiet di diplomacy and mediation between Damascus and Tel Aviv will bear fruit. Overall, um, Israel's failure to deliver knockout blow against the Syrian um, and Iranian-backed Hezbollah movement in the 2006 Lebanon war, the absence of any major progress in the Arab-Israeli peace process, Washington's preoccupation with the Iraq Iraqi and Afghan imbroglios and the volatility um, in international oil markets have magnified Syrian and Iranian influence and diminished the Bush administration's room for maneuver in the Middle East. However, this does not mean that Syri the Syrian-Iranian ax axis is on the ascendant again, I think. Although both countries are defiant, I think both are also on the defensive. Okay, yeah. 
Right, yeah, I found it. Okay, well that's... Reduce this a bit. If you bear with me one second, I'm sorry. I'm not a computer guru. Well, well, um, can actually, I'll, I'll then scroll down. I'll. I suppose you go oh, back yeah. to where you were as it was first, and then maybe you okay. can read yeah, and on, then come down. Two hundred percent. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Oh. That's right. Well, no, that's a bit too big. Uh, that's yeah. okay, and then you move it. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's I'll scroll, yeah. Okay. Right, uh, let me move it up a little. Yeah, sure. okay, yeah, sorry about that, we'll, we'll kind of mm -hmm. scroll down. Um, just, we're, we're wrapping up, so. Um, I've tried to demonstrate a changing balance of power and evolution of the power structure in the Syrian-Iranian alliance in this third and last chart. As you can see for, for 39, as you can see, um, there are three, the 80s, there are three columns, the 1980s, the 1990s, and 2000. And the way I kind of, the overall, it's, it's a bit maybe simplistic, but I think it helps clarify certain things. What I argue is in the 1980s, Syria was the, the, the more dominant partner, relatively speaking. The 1990s was a period of transition, and today the Iran is the more dominant partner in the relationship. Uh, as you can see, for over 29 years, from 1976 to 2005, in addition to its proximity, Syria was the more dominant player in Lebanon due to its sizable military presence in that country. This is no longer necessarily the case with the 2005 withdrawal and the prominent role of Hezbollah in Lebanese politics. Uh, in addition, during the 1980s, Syria's importance in Arab and regional politics was magnified by the fact that Egypt had been banished from the Arab fold after the 1979 Camp David Accords. Of course, it came back after the Amman summit in November 87. And Iraq was entangled between 1980 to 88 with a war against Iran. Furthermore, while both countries had poor relations with the U.S., Syria, unlike Iran, enjoyed the political, military, and economic backing of the other superpower, the Soviet Union, until the late 1980s, once bilateral relations cooled markedly um, under Mikhail Gorbachev. As I mentioned, during the Iran-Iraq conflicts, Syria served as a conduit for arms shipments from the east and west to Iran. Iran's dependency particularly became great after the deterioration of relations with Moscow in 1982 and Washington's efforts to impose a worldwide arms embargo on Iran from 1983 onwards, Operation Staunch, as some of you may recall. As we all know, though, um, necessity is the mother of invention. Therefore, Iran began to develop its own arms industry during the 1980s, and already by the 1990s, it had take the, taken the leading role in joint efforts with Syria to develop ballistic missiles. Today, Iran exports arms to Syria and moreover, moreover finances some Syrian arms purchases from Russia, Belarus, North Korea, and other countries. During the 1980s also, Iran also needed the alliance with Syria in order to prevent uh, in order to, uh, to prevent becoming isolated in the Middle East and also to dispel pro-Iraqi propaganda that the Iran-Iraq war was an Arab-Iranian conflict. Following Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, Iran then men mended fences with many Arab uh, states, including Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Tunisia, Morocco, and Mauritania, to name a few. Today, in spite of its uneasy relations with a number of key Arab governments, um, on the streets, um, Iran enjoys enormous popularity among the Arab masses, uh, even in cities such as Cairo and Amman. Uh, in recent years, I think Iran's, uh, Tehran's power and prestige have been enhanced also by its posturing to date on the nuclear issue, relatively high oil prices on oil markets. It's been a crazy year, as you know, it's January. The, the, the price of barrel of oil crossed over 100 in July. It w went to about a, uh, 150, and you know today it's around 50. But in, in the longer term, I think it's it's going to continue to be volatile and go up again. Um, so uh, posturing on the nuclear issue, oil prices, and the commitment of U.S. forces in Iraq and Afghanistan, where Iran has the capacity to make the situation even more problematic for Washington and its allies and cause mischief. Um, in, in general, I think recent developments have 
diminished, though, the prospect of full-scale conflict between the two camps and have strengthened, to varying degrees, elements on both sides who advocate dialogue and negotiations to resolve their differences. To conclude, though, I think for the foreseeable future, Syria and Iran will continue and perhaps intensify their cooperation in view of the regional situation and the challenges that may lie ahead. Um, I think I shall stop there then and take your questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Aaron, and then uh, Patrick. Aaron, please. Uh, Aaron Miller, Woodrow Wilson Center. You argue very compellingly that this is a strategic relationship that mm -hmm. uh, is tested and be tested by time. Uh, and strategic relationships don't change quickly or easily. Mm -hmm. um, one way to begin to alter this relationship, and mm -hmm. this is a view that is rapidly emerging in Washington, going to be embraced by the Obama administration, mm -hmm. for sure, is um, a full court press on an Israeli Syrian peace agreement. Mm -hmm. Now, assuming, and these are assumptions that need to be taken into account, you could actually have a negotiation that would lead to an agreement that met the needs of both sides. Mm -hmm. Syria found itself reintegrated into the international community mm -hmm. with a political and economic sugar daddy mm -hmm. to meet some of its needs which is what the Egyptians got, right. assuming they do, do a deal. And finally, that Lebanon, well, I would call it a get-out-of-jail-free card, mm -hmm. is issued to the Syrians for their transgressions there. Assuming all of this, humor me, mm -hmm. assuming all of this actually occurred, could you begin to see a fundamental change in the Syrian-Iranian relationship, and by implication, a change in Syria's relationship Mm -hmm. and the boss as well. Right. Okay. Yeah, um, that's, yeah, that's, I, I've seen that also in the, 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 the media and the press, I mean, that, that question, and actually um, a couple of people have asked me that. It's a very good question. Um, I am, as, you know, in, as I said in a short presentation, you can't do, I, I try to, in the book, try to uh, flesh out so people can understand what the relationship is all about. Of course, um, for, for Syria, as I mentioned, it's, it's, it's one of its key priorities is to get the Golan back. Um, I think that's something that the Bashar al-Assad will not compromise on, negotiate on. I think that's something he inherited from his father. I mean, something which has to do with Syria, how it sees its role in history, how um, its national security, and for Bashar al-Assad, in terms of like it was a family thing since his father was defense minister when the Golan was lost in 67 his father was unable to get it back and he's basically feels compelled to follow the script of his father um, kind of kind of paraphrasing also from the very excellent book that Flint Leverett book wrote about Syria inheriting Syria about Bashar al-Assad uh, which I think was, 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 a, was a fine work um, uh, I, I think of course, if there is, uh, if third parties, the U.S. or whoever, uh, Turkey or whatever, hammer out a peace accord and um, there is a peace deal between Syria and, and, um, and Israel, Syria recognizes Israel and gets the gold on back what it lost in 67, that will definitely have a major impact on relations with Iran and cooling relations and diminishing the, the level of co-op. I don't think that in itself will mean the demise of cordial relations, I mean, the alliance may, may basically decrease the, 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 the I, I think for, for, uh, for Syria, there are several other, uh, in the book, I mean, in terms of the way I try to describe in the book, I try to make the reader aware that there are several other elements. Of course, Lebanon is a factor, whether there is an Arab or Israel. Syria sees Lebanon and it's, as its soft underbelly, so irrespective. It wants to have some degree of influence, at least veto power. That's something it got with the Doha agreement in, in May, uh, as, as you know. Um, there's also the issue of Iraq, what happens in Iraq. The, the, the Syrians are very, um, very worried about the situation in, in, in Iraq. And um, um, I, uh, I, I gave a, a, a talk on this topic at Georgetown t uh, two days ago, and the Syrian ambassador showed up there and uh, afterwards said, you know, well, you know, we're very concerned, we're even more concerned than Iran about Iraq in terms of, for us, it was a great travesty, the 2003 U.S.-led invasion. Um, so, I mean, so in terms of both, uh, I think the Iraq situation, as far as the masses are concerned, not only has to be looked in terms of, uh, in func as a function of Damascus-Washington relations, but also what type of government evolves or stabilizes and whether that, that becomes, um, and whether Syrian-Iraqi relations are cordial 
amicable or there's a rivalry. Some may kind of go back to the Omayyads and the Abbasids talking about the, the age-old, the quote-unquote the age-old rivalry between Damascus and Baghdad and also the rivalries which existed. Um, so so I, I think it's, it's, I think it's the Israeli thing is one, but I think for the Syrians, they will also look at Lebanon, uh, Lebanon and if, whether the relationship with Syria helps them enhance their, their role and influence in Lebanon. Iraq, whether um, how the relationship, if relations with, with Iraq are problematic, they'll want to have the checkerboard alliance with, with Iran. Uh, and also relations, uh, relations with the U.S. I think these are all. I think those are the four things to look at. So I, I think that the, the argument you, you see in, the, in, in, in some circles that if there's, that, that if the, you need, to, if you know, you need to peel Syria away from Iran, and if you hammer out this peace deal with Israel, it'll just, it'll end the relationship. I think it'll have a major impact, but that does, does not, that in itself would not necessarily mean the demise of relation of the relation, or at least good relations. Um, uh, in the book, I couldn't. I have a very short section on relations before the revolution. I remember when I was doing my research in '95, um, in, in the 1990s in London. Also, um, I there was I, I was fortunate that two of the two of the Iran's top Arabists. Short yeah. Oh, sorry. Have five oh, sorry. Left on okay. Yeah. Questions. I think I'll stop there. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, Patrick, please. We still have to okay. stop. Patrick Claus, Washington yeah. Yeah. for Near East yeah. Policy. During the 2007-2008. Tensions between Hezbollah and the March 14th movement in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. There were a number of moments when there were suggestions that Iran was urging Hezbollah to reach an agreement, mm -hmm. whereas uh, Syria was suggesting to Hezbollah, uh, no, not until the tribunal is mm -hmm. killed and not until mm -hmm. Syria can return to an important role in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. Could you discuss how you saw, uh, how you see? Syrian-Iranian relations during that and period 2007-2008 over the issue of uh, Hezbollah, the Hezbollah March 14th confrontation. How you think right. it's turned out uh, in the aftermath of the, the Doha Accords? Right. Very brief answer. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, in three well, words. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, if, if it's any, um, Syria and Iran have always had differences. I mean, even from day one in the relationship, but they always try to, um, uh, you know, consult and and, uh, and and reach some sort of compromise. And uh, one of the things I wasn't, even, of course, for Syria, the whole Rafi Kari investigation file is very important. They want that to be put on the back burner or preferably shelved for eternity. So of course that weighs on them. That of, of course for the Iranians that is not a, as a major a major issue for them. So so basically for for Iran, of course they want the situation to be stabilized and they want Hezbollah to be credible within within the Lebanese political framework. Uh, for Syria, of course, then as you mentioned, um, one of the, the things was uh, trying to settle the, the Hariri thing, which is not Iran's priority. So um, if, if, if you'd like to, maybe we can also discuss it more af <laughs> afterwards. Sorry, I, um, uh, okay, uh, Huma, uh, to brief question, I'm going to ask you, you one question and very brief, question. please. Downplay the importance of Kibwe and oil flowing to Syria as an incentive for the state is aligned. Yeah. 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 Ye
of aid, that does not necessarily translate into leverage. So at the time, in the Iran needed Syria more than Syria needed Iran. So in a way, Syria was able to get more and more from Iran. So as you can see, the quote: the more important the recipient is to the donor, the more like the more aid it is likely to receive, but the less leverage such aid will produce. And I think that the Syria-Iran case with regard to oil in the 1980s, when you had the oil, that was a classic case. Iranian oil shipments did not translate into leverage for Iran. I might very brief question. I'm, I'm just intrigued by Aaron's uh, uh, sentence that for the uh, yeah, very slim litigation that it be a get out of jail card for, uh, for Syria. I don't know if you see it both of you as a zero sum game that if you're going to have Syria Israeli litigation, Lebanon has to pay the price. Has to pay the price for that. Could you please comment on that? Uh, I mean, yeah, do we, do we yeah. have to? No, I, well, if I understood, I, I think overall when you look at Syria and Iran and also the, the thing with the relations with Israel and also relations of both countries with the U.S., one should not look at it as a zero-sum game. I think what, what has partially, unfortunately, happened over the past few years is, I mean, well, Iran from the start, from 79 till now, you've had an ideological doctrinaire regime, which is anti-American. Um, and at the same time, over the past years in the U.S., you've had a, an administration which is very much doctrinaire ideological in its outlook. So that has contributed to some of these tensions and also, also with regard to looking at, for example, the situation in Iraq and other places as a zero-sum game. It doesn't have to be like that. It, uh, you know, you can have a government in Iraq which has good relations with the U.S. and has good neighborly relations with Iran. And Lebanon, as I said, I think Syria wants at minimum um, veto power uh, in terms of how it sees its, 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 um, its role historically. Um, and uh, and I, I don't see, uh, I, and also in kind of terms with Israel, Syria, Israel, U.S., I see the, pros the, the prospects of normalization in terms of relations, well, improved relations with the U.S. and also with Israel uh, with regard to Syria, far less problematic because the Syrian regime, I, I think, is much more pragmatic and less doctrinaire. They basically want what they lost in '67, um, and I, I think th this Syria is a much easier nut to crack than Iran. Uh, I, I, I personally think, as long as this regime is in Iran, because anti-Americanism has been one of its the tenets of its foreign policy, relationship the relationship will always fluctuate somewhere between a hot war and a cold peace. Uh, because if if this the, the regime in Iran really, uh, you know. Um, you know, throws away the, the, the baggage of anti-Americanism in a way. What does it have in a way to define itself? So, um, so um, anyway, I mean, maybe they will do it if they think their, their survival, as I said when I was the, the, the consent, if their survival is at stake, then they'll do it. But if that isn't, they'll, you know, make, make some tactical moves, some, you know. But, uh, but, you know, as I said, it doesn't have to be that way. But I think ideology and doctrinairism impedes things, and that, I think that's one of the problems we've had also with the Bush administration. So I'm hoping with Obama he'll be more pragmatic and flexible. Pra being pragmatic and flexible does not necessarily mean being, being weak or whatever, but, but you know, being more realistic and pragmatic, less rigid in your, in your outlook and your policies. Um, I'm going to one last question. I know there are more, but just one last question. Mark, very brief. Yeah, okay. Um, mm. Well, I know we all like to play this uh, strategic uh, chessboard, and uh, I think you made a, a compelling case that uh, what is a very durable relationship must be something beyond a marriage of convenience. But I would nevertheless like you, as someone who works in a strategic studies my center, nevertheless ask you to revisit the other, another possible explanation for the durability of this relationship, which you tended to dismiss, and that was the question of identity. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm not sure I agree that, uh, you know, Hafez Assad's uh, failure to visit Tehran uh, is uh, testimony that uh, he's not considered a kind of a, a kosher Muslim, and that's why he can't get to Tehran. I mean, Hugo Chavez is neither. Uh, the real uh, question to my mind is, back to your core question about regime survival, mm -hmm. given the... Uh, 
the fact that uh, unless I completely misunderstand, Sunnis are even more skeptical about the religious legitimacy of Alawi. Mm -hmm. right. Shia, and that right. Syria is, a, after all, basically a Sunni yeah. society. Yeah. Is it not really important, given the Alawi character of the, or centrality of their Alawi elements in the regime, that somebody testify or, or certify that they're kosher Muslims? And if I understand correctly, it was actually done by Shia... It was done by Imam Musa Sadr, Sadr. Yeah, yes. in the mid-70s, yeah, yes. you know, Lebanese cleric, yeah. So, I mean, do you, do you dismiss all this identity business and say uh, the Alawi's kind of uh, questionable status has nothing to do with the, after all, long-standing affinity between these two regimes? Right. Well, okay, Defense. yeah, right. <laughs> well, no, no, it's interesting. As I said, I, I did a lot of research on this, and I, um, I mean, it's there, and I think a lot of the detractors of the two regimes point this out. And to, to a degree, I'm, I'm sure among the, the circles of the regime and the Alawites, of course, it is a consideration, it is a worry, but in terms of the, the relationship, I argue, between Syria and Iran, it's, it's primarily based on, um, as I said, on political, strategic, um, and, and, um, and, and economic interests. Um, as, you know, you had the, uh, the blessing of, of, of Imam Musa Sadr, but, um, but ultimately, um, uh, you know, um, one of the things also to look at is these regimes are not, to, to a degree, even an authoritarian regime needs to be concerned about public opinion. Yeah, exactly. But when push comes to shove, even when you look at this relationship, um, for, for many periods I try to touch on, uh, I really haven't really, but if you look at, uh, especially, for example, in the 1980s and whatever, if you went out on the street in Damascus, the average Syrian would say, why is our government not backing brotherly Arab Iraq in the war against these uh, Persian Iranians and all that, or people in Tehran at the same time, you know, is, is saying Assad is taking us for a ride, getting all this free oil, and w what are we getting out of it? So, so you have that, but but, but at the same time, as we're going back to regimes, you know, a re authoritarian regime is not worried about the ballot box and losing the next election. Of course, it doesn't want to turn everybody off, uh, turn everybody against it, but but basically, it does try tries to do other things in the realm of politics, economics, and society to keep people happy or tamed or or quiet. At least so, so um, you know. So if we were talking about quasi, well, semi-democratic or democratic regimes, of course I think. But uh, you know, this is a relationship which has been between the political elites of the country. It's not a relationship between the people of the country. So and that's and it, it's it's. I think that's important too. So the, the the religious element, as I said, at best it's a minor issue. That, that's my argument. I, I you know you can I, you know I, I I don't claim to be omniscient. I, and I my and my book um, I consider it. I hope it's a comp contribution to the field. I'm not saying everything I've written is correct. And if somebody comes out and corrects me or blows me out completely out of the water or says these aspects, then I will come in. I just look at myself as a person who tries to contribute to the dialogue, to, to, to the process, to scholarly research, and then and to enrich it. Um, um, I, don't, I don't consider to have a monopoly or, or even about recent events with 87, 88, like knowing all the minute details of, uh, uh, so that's, yeah. Thank you very much, and hope to see you back again. Thank you.